Well, good morning. My name is Bill Walker. I'm the lead pastor here at Quest Church, and I'll be sharing the message today. Um, I'm going to have a few announcements, and then we're going to continue worshiping. You'll hear a short, probably about a 25, 30-minute uh, message, and then we'll have a closing song, and that's how we're going to do our service this morning. Um, first of all, if you are, uh, if you've been been coming here for the first few weeks during our Christmas season, you've probably heard, but it's continuing. We have our annual Christmas challenge. And this year, our Christmas challenge is to raise money for Victoria Global Ministries that is an orphanage in Kenya. And it was founded by Faith Maturi, who's one of our members. We're partnering with her and helping them uh, raise funds for both the sponsorship of children and long-term as well for building. So you can give to that uh, one or two ways. You can fill out this envelope to uh, do a one-time gift this Christmas season. Uh, it's right here. You can fill that out. Or if you want to, you can sponsor a child. And we have 20 different children out there. And uh, you can sponsor them for $10 to $25 a month or anywhere in between or more if you want. Uh, I just about to pick up John's name this morning. I'm going to read a little bit about John. It says, John came to the center with his sister Sarah and his cousin, Louis and Brian. His parents are deceased. His grandmother, who was suffering from the effects of a stroke, was trying to raise her 13 grandchildren. And many of them were malnutrition uh, when they came there, and a lot of them have come to the orphanage, and it's been life-changing for them. They're getting fed daily, uh, good meals, they're being educated. So it's given John and his brothers and his cousins uh, the ability to do this. So we really want to urge you and encourage you to make a gift to that. All monies that are collected will go directly uh, for that cause, and we think it's a really, really good one. Uh, Faith, right now, the whole team went over there to purchase land, and I guess they purchased it for an orphanage site. Right now they're renting land, and it's working fine, but they want a permanent home, so they've got, I think it's an acre and a half, um, the, uh, very close to the school. There's a uh, bit of land between them and the school, so it's a perfect location. So Faith Maturi is, is there. She's founded the organization. Amber Shippington's there right now. Dale Teal and Jeremy LeVay. In fact, they're on flight. They've left Amsterdam about five or six this morning. They're flying right now uh, back to the States. And uh, I want to hear, we'll hear more about those trip, the trip. When they get back, I think I'm going to have Faith uh, speak maybe that uh, first Sunday after Christmas so she can talk about that. They've had an exciting trip. Uh, I don't know if you follow Facebook, but uh, uh, Jeremy LeVan and Dale Teal were arrested while in Kenya. And uh, Jeremy LeVan uh, was taking pictures of the police station, so the police arrested him. And I guess they only spent three, I don't know if you know Jeremy, but he probably uh, deserved to be arrested. <laughs> uh, I'm saying that publicly to all you. <laughs> he is quite a character, and we love him, but uh, I'm sure we'll hear that story when they come back. And then uh, he got arrested for doing that, and then they're walking away. I guess uh, Jeremy's holding the camera down, continuing to take pictures <laughs> as they're being escorted away from the police station. I wish I had that man's faith. Uh, <laughs> we need media techs to run PowerPoint back there. If you're experiencing that or if you're inexperienced and want to do that, we've had a, a, a lot of people leave from the Indian Lake campus, and that's good. And they've taken some of the uh, uh, techs with them with our blessing. So that's created some opportunities for service here at Quest. Um, our First Fruits weekend is December uh, 19th and 20th. And uh, we'll talk more about that here at the beginning of the sermon. But uh, what we're going to do is the kids are going to be coming in and they're going to have banks that they fill with their change. Uh, we'd like people, if you want to, you can bring in your first fruit offering to the campaign. Some of you have already done that. And you'll just come up and put an envelope that says, you know, uh, already gave first fruits or whatever. But if you want to do that, we're just going to celebrate the, the campaign wrapping up by doing this. And I'm going to bring uh, some chains that we have from uh, home. And, uh, you know, some of the kids that morning will forget their change, and we don't want anybody to come up here without any change. So I thought, any of you that bring change from home that day, maybe we'll line up uh, as the children come in, and we'll put our change in their little uh, in their containers, and they can dump it in the wheelbarrow, and that's where we'll put it in, too. So that's December 19th and 20th. And my last announcement is this. On uh, December 20th, that evening, there's a longest night of service that's uh, started by uh, Dick Barrett, No Grove Mennonite Church. And they've moved that, they think, to a better location here at the Green Hill Retirement Home. And it's a service that, uh, for people that have uh, dealt with a loss for that year, a loss of any time. And it's also open for everybody, but it's a time of reflection. It's a time of remembering the losses that we've had and acknowledging those losses. And it's also a time for hope. And as many of you know, we lost our son about two and a half years ago, Christopher. And they've asked me to speak at that service. So I'll be uh, speaking at that on December 20th. If you've experienced loss or just want to hear about the hope of Christmas, uh, 
we don't want that to be a downer for a service, but we're going to acknowledge our losses and, and just share about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So it's about a 45-minute service, and it's usually near the longest evening of the year. I think the winter solstice is usually around uh, December 22nd, 20th in that area, so they try to plan it right around that time. So then you'll see more information in the bulletin about that. Well, if you're comfortable, if you'd like to get around and greet a few people, we're going to give you the opportunity to do that. If not, you can just stand as we continue worshiping the Lord this morning. So let's stand as we continue our service. He's way ahead of me. He saw everybody already. How are you? Hi there. How are you? Hi, how are you? Good to see you.
and she'd start out with small gifts and our stockings and the presents would get bigger and bigger, uh, not in size but in value. And our favorite, the one gift that we really wanted would always be in the very back. And she would wrap the gifts uh, with the same color paper so we would open them together and we would get different things, but it was always fun. So I go in there, the gifts are all lined up. I see my brother's gift row with his gifts. Don't even remember what they were, don't even care. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I did it. My gifts were lined up, and, and I'll never forget it. The very back, there's this, this box. It has a square bottom and a long neck going up on top. And I knew I got my, my guitar. I was excited. So we go through all the gifts, got this, got this, got this. And uh, finally, we get to the last gift. And I was on the floor. I remember, I put that box on my lap, and my mother goes, I bet you don't know what I got you. And I just kind of joked around there and said, oh, I don't know. Maybe I, you know, I don't know if I do or not. Maybe I do. And, and then I opened up that gift and I tore off the wrapping paper, opened up the box, and I looked down, and there was a banjo. <laughs> True story. But that's why I've been in therapy for 40 years. But there's a banjo sitting there, and I remember my mom said two things, and I never forget this. She looked at me and she said, you're surprised, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah. And then she said this to me. She said, I feel like you're a guy with your personality needed a banjo, not a guitar. And I'm like, okay, just take a clown nose, put it on me. Get some big clown boots. You know, hey girl, you want to come up and listen to my banjo? So I got this, this banjo, 1977. Never forget it. Never forget it. And uh, we begin to process this, and I processed this over the last few years. First of all, my mother loved me. I mean, she wasn't trying to be mean or, you know, saying a guy like you doesn't need a guitar, but uh, she really did love me. And she gave me the gift that she thought I needed at the time. Thirty-nine years later, I still have that banjo. It's at home right now. I don't, I don't play it anymore, and uh, but I still have it. And my mother and father were great. They loved me. And, you know, when she gave me that gift, it's kind of awkward. And I did take it back to Miami University with me. And you know what? I was never the best banjo player at Miami University. But usually I was the only banjo player <laughs> in the circles that I hung around with. You know, so I couldn't play the guitar, but I could play the banjo. And, and uh, over the years, I, I think I'm really glad that she, she got it for me. So uh, I'll, never, I'll never forget that uh, Christmas of 1976. When we talk about God, uh, the giver, when we talk about the gifts, really, the gift begins with the giver. Because I can want a gift as much as I think I need it, I can long for it, yearn it, pray about it, desire it, cover it, I want this gift, I want it, I want it, I want it. But if there's not a giver that's willing to give it to me, I'm not going to get that gift, am I? So when we think about giving, giving doesn't really start with the receiver, it starts with the giver. And, uh, you know, mom decided what I was going to get that year, and I, I got it, it worked out. And when we talk about the gospel, God is the ultimate giver. He decides what gift he's going to give and when and how he's going to give it. And the story of God's giving, this is uh, usually a verse not associated with Christmas, but John 3.16 is the verse in the Bible. If you ever memorize a verse in the Bible or get one, you should just commit to memory and really pray about it. And, and live it. It's so important, but it's, it's the entire gospel, really. And it's written by John. And, and John, the book of John, John was one of the disciples, probably the person that, uh, that wrote this gospel. And he talks more about love than any other of the gospels. I think about 80% of John is not in the other gospels. And John, in his gospel written about Jesus Christ, time and time again, he talks about love. And John 3, 16 is no different. And John says uh, this, uh, they don't know if it's John saying it or Jesus is saying it to John. Uh, but here are the words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And I think that was Jesus uh, saying that to John, and John was quoting him. That's what the scripture, that's what the Bible, that's why we're here as a church, because of, uh, of who we are and what we want to do. And really, it's all about John 3.16. It really captures the heart of God and what he chooses to do to us and through us. 
So if we begin to look at this, we're going to take the rest of the day and break this down, not word by word. We're going to look at some words and phrases and see what we come up as we study John 3.16. Like I said, it's not usually associated with Christmas. And so the first part of that is, 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 is for God. It begins with God. And we said this earlier, a gift begins with a giver. If you don't have a gift, if you don't have a giver, you're never going to have a gift. And the gift of Jesus Christ for humanity then begins with God, not with us. Not with Jesus Christ himself, but with God. And thirdly, God is the ultimate giver because he gave the ultimate gift. So what did God do? Well, if we look at the second part, for God so loved. So God loved. And we want to talk about three things when we talk about God loving. First of all, God loved because that is what God does. He represents love. He invented love. He's the embodiment of love. Uh, later on in John, it says this, that God is love. Love is what God is, and God is what love is. The second part of love is, is also important. And James Dobson, I heard him say this years ago, and he said this, love is an action. And when I thought about that, I thought, really? And the more I think about it over the years, he's, he's totally right. Love is an action. Is it emotion? Well, sometimes. But you know, our emotions ebb and they flow, they get stronger, they get weak. Our emotions are just all over the place. But love is constant and never fails. And if I say I love someone, if I say I love my wife, but I don't back it up with actions, if I mistreat her, if I don't spend time with her, if I take her for granted, if I don't do the things that please her, is that really love? So love is an action. And the third part about God, when we talk about God and his love, God's reason for giving us the gift of Jesus Christ is simply love. I've said this before, but I believe that you know, everything was going on in heaven, and, and God has just this, so much love that he wants to share. And I think that's why he invented, uh, he uh, let humans come around here and put humans on this earth, because he wanted to share his love. And it's the same thing when you young people get married, and they have everything in the world, everything's going great, and two or three years into marriage, if it's the right type of marriage that God honors, and things like that, two or three years into the marriage, they're going to say this, let's have children. And why would two people, that everything's going so great, perfectly, why would they want to bring children into the world? You know, you're going to be up in the middle of the night, you're going to be changing diapers. You know, it, it makes no sense. And I used to tell Andrew and Christopher, you guys are a drain on my resources. <laughs> why do we do that? And why do we do that? It's because of love. We want to share the love. It's really natural. There's just that natural tendency that we want to do that. And it's the same with God. God created humanity because he wanted to share the love. So... Who or what did God love? God loved the world. We've heard that so many times. God loved the world. But we really need to look at that to understand what God, uh, what the writer of, of John, and, and I think Jesus said himself, what was Jesus talking about when he said the world? First of all, uh, the world back in that time, the disciples and the Jewish people who heard this would have been surprised because they thought God only loved them, the Jewish people. They knew, they heard through Scripture, they, the, the, the Jewish people through Abraham and then through Jacob and Isaac and, and every, through that lineage of the Jewish people. We've talked about them through Joseph. We, we, we studied him a few months ago. That's how God manifested his love was through the Jewish people. For them and for them only. And Jesus primarily ministered to the Jewish people. He, he did some other people that weren't Jewish, Samaritan woman and other people as well. But primarily, uh, Jesus ministered through the Jewish people. So when the Jewish people heard this, that God so loved the world, they would have thought, I thought God just loved us. You mean he loves other people too? That, that would have really, they would have found that a little bit different. Like, wow, I thought it was just about us. And to kind of drive this point home, the world, uh, the word, the world, has a different meaning, or it had a different nuance back then than it does today. See, our current English translation of the Greek word for the world is much more personal than the original Greek meaning. In the original Greek, the world basically meant every single person in the world. So when they heard this, when they heard Jesus say this and, God, they, and John recorded, it would have been because God loves every single individual in the world. Or God loves every person ever created. Or you can make a giant list of everybody born before, during, after, and said, because God so loved, and you could read that entire list. And today, you could say this, because God so loved, and you could put your name in there. So I would say, uh, for God so loved Bill Walker. And it makes it a very personal thing. 
So when the uh, Jewish people would have heard that back then, and the people in and around it, uh, uh, Jerusalem and Israel and Bethlehem, everybody back then would have heard that, they would have said, wow, it's about us as individual per people. And that gets sometimes lost in translation. So God loves the world, not just the Jewish people. And he loves every single person in the world, no matter what. In Romans 5.8, this is the New Living Translation. Paul, greatest missionary who ever lived, is writing a letter to the Romans. And he says this, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. So God sent Jesus to die for us, not after we cleaned up our act and we got ready for him. No, just the way that we are. And God continues to offer Jesus Christ to us in our current state. Because God's never going to love you any more than he does right now. Let me repeat that. God is never going to love you any more than he does right now. And that applies to me and you and every person in this room. <clears throat> now, when I say that, you say, well, what? God might not approve of what you're doing, but he loves us all. He loves us all. And he gives us, offers us the gift of Christ. And we're going to talk about that. So God loves us all just as we are. God loved the world and he loves each and every one of us again. Just the way we are right now. Okay, for God so loved the world. Love is an action, man. God will probably do something. And he did. So he, what he did is he gave his only son. He gave his only son. And God gave because love is an action. And the Greek word we translate as gave also meant sacrifice or offer. And God only had one son. You think about that. God had one son to give. And he offered or he sacrificed that one son. Now, he had his, he, he's got as much joy as there is. He, he's got an overabundance of joy. He's got an overabundance of forgiveness that he offers us. He's got an overabundance of, of just seeking us out. He's got an overabundance of, of, of forgiveness. But he's only got one son. So he sent the one thing that was most important to him. He offered to us. And, and that, that is truly amazing. Now, Gabe is a translator, the translation you always see. But again, if you really get into the Greek and Roman and, and study it, it also means sacrifice or offer. So what if I say it this way? For God so loved each and every person in the world, you and you and you and you, that he sacrificed his only son. It takes a little bit of a different meaning, doesn't it? For, for God so loved every single person, individual in the world, he offered his son. It takes a little different meaning, doesn't it? And when a giver offers us a gift, we really have two choices, and only two choices. We can accept the gift, or we can reject the gift. That's not, that's not up to the giver, though. That's up to us. So when God offers us the gift of Christ, we can either accept Christ, or we can reject Christ. Now, once we accept Christ, then we have another choice. We can continue to grow in him or we can neglect him. But you can't, you can't neglect Christ until you accept him. So the only two choices we have when, when God offers us his gift, God the giver offering up the gift of Christ, is to accept Christ or reject Christ. Um, does anybody ever come up to you and say, I have an offer for you that you can't refuse? Can you refuse it? You can yeah. And I think, to me personally, Jesus Christ is the offer we can't refuse. But can we refuse it? Absolutely. We can refuse that gift. So, continuing John 3, 16. God loved the world. He gave his son because of an action. The last part of this is so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And uh, who will not perish? Who is this about? Well, the same people that have eternal life. It all goes together. People that have eternal life will not perish, and those that will not perish have eternal life. And who or what uh, Jesus is talking about, and John is quoting, is everyone who accepts the giver, God's gift, 
who believes in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior has eternal life. And what you're hearing today is a Christmas message about the giver, but it's really the gospel in a nutshell. That's who's going to have eternal life. So again, there's choices here. And with the choices, what happens if we don't accept the giver's gift and accept Jesus as our personal Savior? Well, we perish, and we don't have eternal life. And perish doesn't just mean die. It goes beyond that. Perish means that, that, that we die, but it also means that uh, we are eternally separated from God. Perish means there's no hope whatsoever. It's done. It's over. We are separated from God. Now, you say, if you're uh, kind of moving ahead of me with this, you say, well, wait a second. You just said God loves everybody, and now you're saying it's possible to be, to be separated from God. What's that, what's that all about? So how could God, the great giver, the perfect giver, if he is truly a loving God, how could he send his children to perish? And perish means separate him. Basically, how can he send people to hell? I mean, is that consistent with somebody who loves? And I've heard the people argue this before. That's a great question. That's a valid question. How could a loving God send people to hell? Who would do something like that? Well, the answer is this. God doesn't send people to hell. We choose when we don't believe or when we reject the gift of Christ. Because again, for something to become a gift, it has to be accepted. Okay, if it's not accepted, it's rejected. We don't get the gift. And we don't get what goes along with that gift. And probably the best proof of this is in from the, again, the Gospel of John. It says this, and this is the very beginning of it. And again, he's talking about love all through the Gospel of John. But the writer of John sets it up almost in the first 12 verses. He says this. He says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor human decision or husband's will, but born of God. So if you believe his name, you have the right to become one of God's children. If you believe. Okay? So it, it, it's... God says, you know, my love is open to everybody. My gift of Christ is open to everybody. But then you make the choice. And if you accept this, you're one of my children. And if you're not, you're not one of my children. So if you hear somebody very lovingly say to you, you know, I don't believe there's a hell because I don't believe God could ever send any of his children to hell. Well, he could. But we get to make the choice of whether we're God's child or not. <coughs> and uh, for love to exist, there has to be free will. You know, you can't force anybody to love you. And God does the same. He doesn't force his love upon anybody, but he gives, he offers his love to us, and then we make the decision. So, what does all this mean? As we begin to kind of look at this and wrap it up, um, what does this mean, and what should I do? And maybe some of you have never given your life to Christ, and maybe you're here for a for that this morning, to you heard the gospel, maybe, just maybe, it's your time to give your life to Christ. But some other people here are giving your life to Christ. So what does this mean for you? What, what should we do about all this? Well, first of all, I just mentioned it. Personally accept the giver's gift. Give your life to Christ. If you've never done so, we're going to give a chance at the end. We're going to pray. Everybody's going to pound their head and close their eyes, and we're not even going to bring the the, the worship team up here until we do that. And I'm going to give you to the, the chance to accept this gift that is offered to you. You don't have to. It's up to you. But I'm going to give you the chance to do that at the end of the, of the service today. So that's the first thing. And, you know, I accepted the gift of, uh, of uh, Christ when I was 15 years old. And I grew up in the church all my life. So it took me 15 years uh, to do that. And I, I don't know why. I know I heard the gospel before that. But for some way, some reason, uh, I was 15 years old. I heard the gospel. I was at a spaghetti uh, supper, another youth pro pro program near our church. And it took me that long to accept the gift of Christ. So you could be in the church 5, 10, 15, or 20 years and never accept the gift. Maybe it's time to do that. You could be visiting for the first time. You go, you know what? That makes sense. I think I'll do that today. That's the first, uh, the first response that we want to talk about. Secondly, Let's say you've already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Use the gift. Make the gift of Christ part of your daily life. You know, it's not like we say, okay, Jesus, we're going to follow you. 
I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and then we walk away, you say, you know, Jesus, I'll check back in with you right before I die or on my deathbed. I'll check back in. No, that's, that's not the way that God intends it. I guess it works. I don't know. Technically, I guess you could still get to heaven that way. But that's not really the faith that Jesus ever wanted for us. There's things that we can do in our daily life to share this love of God with others. And I've said this before. If I said to you, I have a million dollars, you can give it away. And every time you give a million dollars away, I'll give you another million to give away. And some of you become all your friends and everybody and give them this million away two or three times a day because you see the value in it. Well, in Jesus Christ and the gift of eternal life, we have something much more valuable than money, and you can give that away as many times as you want. Again, the other person can accept or reject it, but you can offer it to people. And we're responsoring for we're responsible for offering. But we're not responsible for accepting. That's the work of the Holy Spirit uh, through Jesus Christ working. So make the, the gift of Christ part of your daily life. And when we become Christians, uh, we also uh, get these spiritual gifts immediately. As soon as we say, uh, Jesus, I want to accept you as Lord and Savior, immediately and for the rest of our life, we have these spiritual gifts. And one of those is hospitality. Uh, one of them uh, uh, could be uh, encouragement. Uh, one of them is exhortation, sharing the gospel with others. There's all sorts of gifts. Once you have that, use that gift. But there's other things that we have that are considered talents that we need to share as well. And uh, the people that are up here on the worship team, they have a talent of playing a musical instrument or singing. It's not a spiritual gift. It would be the same talent whether they were doing it in church or uh, you know, doing it in downtown Columbus uh, if they wanted to, at a, a venue, any, anywhere they wanted to. It's, it's a gift of singing. But we can choose to use our, our, our natural gifts, not our, our spiritual gifts, in a way that would please God and glorify Him. So we can also use our talents and abilities as, as well as our spiritual gifts in the church uh, for other people. They're never meant to be hoarded, hoarded. So use the gift and use the gifts that you have. And thirdly, what you can do, what this, this means to you, uh, give the gift of Christ to others. Share the gospel with other people. You just heard the gospel in a nutshell. Um, just explain the gospel. And you can tell people here, here's the difference Jesus made in my life. Here's what's going on if you feel comfortable with doing that. Uh, there's, there's verses you can share. And if you need that, let me know. You can share in the scripture if you want to lead somebody to Christ. There. Um, if you don't want to do that, invite them to church. Invite them to this church. We, we've really, really worked hard making this church a church that you can invite your friends. And I don't know about you, but have you ever, don't raise your hands, have you ever gone to a church where you wouldn't invite your friends? I have. And I would not invite a friend there. And if there's some things that we need to change to make it more inviting to the friends you have, let us know. And that's why we do a lot of what we do. We want to make this place a church where you feel comfortable enough that you can invite your friends. And so just even do that. And uh, I might have mentioned this the other week. Do you know the number one time of the year to invite people to church? Christmas season. And you know the number one part of the Christmas season? Christmas Eve services. And then some of your friends might be out of town, but invite uh, people to church. Invite them to the Christmas Eve service. Uh, invite them during this time of year. And we've gone to three Christmas Eve services. Uh, we could probably fit everybody in two because a lot of our people travel when they're gone. Probably about a third of our people. But a lot of them are still here. And we've gone to three Christmas Eve services, so you can invite as many friends as you want. Say, hey, would you like to come to, uh, to church with me Christmas Eve? And uh, we'll share the message as well. So there's all sorts of ways to do it. And uh, what I'm going to do right now, I said I was going to do it at the end of the service. We're going to pray. And if there's anybody here that wants to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that today before we leave. And uh, when we're done praying then, I'm going to uh, remain up here uh, to pray with people if they've done that, if you want to come forward, but you don't have to. And uh, I, I really feel led to do that. Or if there's other people that will come up and pray with them uh, from the prayer team that would be willing, if you'll come up and I can go back and, and greet visitors as they leave, that's fine. But somebody needs to be up here, so I'll start. If somebody else comes up, they can say, hey, Bill, we got you covered, and I can go back because you don't have to pray with me. You can pray with everybody, anybody. Or talk to me this week and say, hey, I, I want to accept Jesus. But we're going to give you that opportunity now. So the worship team's not coming up. What we want everybody to do at this time is to bow your head and to close your eyes. And I'm just going to pray what you need to pray if you want to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Maybe you could recommit your life to Christ if you want to. 
Or maybe you can just pray this prayer and just be thinking about somebody on your mind that doesn't know Jesus. So every head bowed now and every eye closed. Um, just repeat. You can say it. You can whisper it. You can just say it in your heart. This is all what we, uh, we need to do. Um, Heavenly Father, I know I've made mistakes. And uh, these mistakes that I've made are called sin. And Father, you uh, seek a better life for me than these sins. So at this time, through the work of Jesus on the cross, I just, I just give my sins over to you. And Father, I ask you for forgive, uh, to forgive me from my past, present, and future sins. And I invite Jesus Christ into my heart to take full control. And Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and as my Savior. Now, every eye still closed, every head bowed. If you've done that, I'd just like to know. So just put your hand up right now. I see two, I see three, I see four, five. Keep, keep those hands up. Okay, seven, eight. Eight people have done that today. I would love to talk to you through an email or one-on-one -on -one about your next steps to continue to grow in God's grace. But uh, you can contact me uh, this week if you want. So let's uh, close in prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, I celebrate eight people that have made the decision to, to follow you. Father, it's a great day at Quest today. I would just ask that you would continue to walk with these people, lead them to where you want to lead them in following you. Make yourself known in new and exciting ways. We pray for the Christmas season and the plans you have for us. And Father, just give us the, uh, the burning desire in our hearts to share this, uh, this gospel of, of goodness and grace and the the fellowship of Jesus Christ with other people. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Eight people gave their lives to Christ today. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. That doesn't include the people that came, did so last night and this morning as well. So again, if you want to contact me, I'd love to talk to you about your next steps if you've chosen Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Worship team, why don't you come on up? Uh, I'm going to be up here to pray if there's some people from our prayer team or that want to do that. Instead, I'll read visitors at the end. But if not, I'll stay up here. Somebody will be up here at the end of the service if you want prayer for any reason uh, whatsoever. Uh, whatsoever. So, hey, let's stand and let's celebrate those eight new decisions as we sing our final song.
we thank you for those those people that uh, that prayed the prayer with Bill this morning. We've added to your kingdom, Lord. And the angels are just, they're having a party. Amen. I'm overwhelmed, Lord. Overwhelmed at your love and your grace and your mercy. And we thank you for this time that we can come together and worship and praise your name and listen to your word. And we can keep that close to our hearts as we leave this place. We love you and we thank you for all the blessings you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name. God bless you as you come.